Hello champs and welcome to another episode of the Keeping Carlson Short Shift Program. I am your host, Ben Burnett, and joining me as always, Lewis Ezekiel, and the E is for egregious leg injury to Douglas Hamilton. Lewis, how are you doing tonight? Uh, better every time I close the tab that is showing the replay of Hamilton getting bent back over that leg. It looks really grim. It's disgusting, yeah. I think we've, I mean, from a very callous, dispassionate point of view, I think we've got to recommend that people bid on Jake Gardner tonight uh, if they have fab bids or run out and grab him if he's available. But uh, obviously, we want to hope that that injury is not as bad as it looks, but we'll have to find out how Hamilton is doing a little bit later on. Well, yes, and we say that, but I don't believe that the the Hurricanes had a power play after Dougie went out of the game tonight. So the assumption is that Gardner would take over on power play one. I don't think I'm going out blowing fab on Gardner tonight, but I might throw a buck or two out there just because the upside is relatively high. Yeah, I'm not sure I have someone who I'm especially anxious to drop, so that may prevent me from trying to make a move. But um, I don't know. We'll see how things progress. Yeah, so uh, as Lewis mentioned, maybe don't go out and find the replay, but just know that we may be looking at a multi-week injury for uh, for the probably the the Norris favorite at this point, Dougie Hamilton. Certainly, you know, having the breakout season that we've been hoping for him for ages, you know, just good to see him finally get a spot where he was getting full access to that top power play. Very disappointing, of course, to see it potentially derailed by such an injury. Absolutely. Uh, Our number one headline tonight, I mean, at least when we prepped, obviously the Dougie Hamilton news has superseded quite a bit from the fantasy perspective, but number one has to be in Vegas where Gerard Gallant is out and Pete DeBoer is in in Las Vegas for the Golden Knights. Uh, The Knights did not have a skate this morning and they did have a game tonight, but it was announced just before the game that William Carlson will be out week to week. Uh, that's obviously going to affect the line since he's coming off the top unit with Marcia so and Smith, where he's been playing for about three years straight. So it's kind of hard to read into these lines too much. Uh, we were chatting with Brian and Elon earlier today, and they said that they will be discussing the coaching swap more in depth on Sunday's show. What we've started with in the meantime, though, is Marcia so and Smith with Chandler Stevenson, Pacioretty, Stastny, and Stone on line two, and then Alec Tuck all the way down on line three with Eakin and Nozick. Kind of what we were discussing on Tuesday when we talked about the return of Jonathan Marcia so. You're interested to see what Stevenson can do on a decent line. It's nice to see Stastny back in the top six, and it's still a bummer for Tuck all the way down on line three. Overall, I'm, I'm kind of just bummed out about this. I thought that Gallant did a great job with an expansion squad in Las Vegas that, you know, no one really had high hopes for. Yeah, I think you and the the analytics folks on Twitter were really having some problems with this just because some of their issues lately are the result of a big-time dive in PDO that seems likely to regress, you know, just not having very much puck luck. But at the same time, you know, if you're looking at it from a results-based standpoint, there's an argument to be made that it's unacceptable for Vegas to be out of the playoff race in the Pacific, which is a pretty weak division. That being said, it's so tight, you know, two we- uh, two games from now, they could lead the division. It seems clear that they're going to be victorious in tonight's uh, Thursday night's game. It seems like maybe a drastic move, maybe an overreaction, but uh, time will tell how this works out. Uh, in terms of the individual players... You know, I I would have thought also that Stevenson would drop. Obviously, that was not the case with Wild Bill injured, so we don't know if Stastny is on line two to stay, but he had a great night, uh, scored a goal in the first minute of the game, so if anything, he's putting his best foot forward, obviously. Uh, As you said, not great for Tuck. Um, He didn't do much of anything on his last foray into the top six, as we talked about in the last episode. I'm not super surprised to see him left on line three. Uh... We talked some last week about how Michael Blake McCurdy's numbers suggested that John Hines could maybe improve the offense in Nashville without hurting the defense compared to, compared to LaViolette. Uh, this prediction hasn't been especially strong thus far on the surface, but looking at those same sets of numbers, DeBoer and Gallant are nearly identical. This is something that, 
uh, Elon and Brian talked about on the Patron cast uh, last night, where they spent 96 minutes answering every question they got from the patrons, a cool perk. Uh, it just seems kind of like a side grade, with a chance for DeBoer to possibly win the locker room back, if that's the problem that the Vegas admins were trying to fix um, by removing Gallant. So, you know, that's something, but... Yeah, I can see why a lot of people might be upset, especially with uh, the recent history between these two teams in the Stanley Cup playoffs. Man, I don't even know if I see it as a side grade. Like, I think it's a clear downgrade. We saw what DeBoer did in San Jose this year, the team kind of falling off the rails. I don't see why he would be better with a team in Vegas that had amazing underlying numbers. They were fantastic from a results perspective, back-to-back years, and they were only three points out start uh, when he was fired from the Pacific Division crown. So I don't really see it as a side grade. I see it as a totally incomprehensible move that did not need to be made. It's a little tough to draw fantasy conclusions this early, as I mentioned. So, you know, I I prefer to just move on and sort of leave it for Brian and Elon. But right now, just first thoughts are a bit of a bummer. Just quickly, do you think Gallant was a victim of the expectations he set up for himself with his successes in the early going? I don't think that it's clear at all what happened or why he was fired. Like his, I don't see why you would fire someone who's you know on pace to be another to go back to the playoffs and have another run. I just, I, I don't even know what possible reasoning you could have for cutting bait on him at this point, unless it turns out that he was you know, actually being uh, Bill Peters-esque in the locker room. So maybe just a victim of overmanagement from the front office. That's the, that's the most sensical thing that like explanation that I could feel for at this point. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll let Brian and Elon talk about it more on Sunday. Uh, Let's talk about the goalie situation in New York. Oh my God, Lewis, a man after my own heart here. You want to talk Rangers? Let's get right into it. Uh, Obviously, the Rangers called up Igor Shosturkin early last week, and he posted two wins immediately. You would have thought, hey, why not let it ride with the kid? But of course, instead, the Rangers went with Lundqvist the next game and Georgiev the the following. Looks like we were on a bit of a goalie carousel, which then, theoretically, would lead back to Shosturkin for the the game after Georgiev, but instead they put Georgiev back in net for a second straight start against the Islanders. Georgiev was excellent again tonight. He made 21 of 22 saves in the first period, which is ridiculous. And then the Rangers game just ended with a win for the Rangers. Uh, Georgiev wound up making... 38 saves on 40 shots in an incredible performance. I mean, it's difficult to argue that they made the wrong decision starting him. But, you know, what's the point of calling up Shostyorkin if you're just going to leave him in the press box for four straight games, right? Like, I, I just don't understand. If we've learned one thing about goaltending in the NHL over the past few years, it's that a three-pronged attack really doesn't make sense. So I'm just confused about what's going on. Where is this carousel going to land? It can't possibly continue like this. It seems like the place that this is heading is trying to showcase Georgiev for a trade, potentially, since they are unlikely to sell off Lundqvist, who, you know, obviously there's a ton of institutional memory for him. uh, And, you know, he doesn't have super appealing numbers that I think someone is anxious to go out and grab him. Uh, So... Until they can find a trade partner, and it can be tough to find the right partner, the right deal, we may see this continue for a while. I, I agree with you. I think send Shostyorkin down so that he can get some starts at the AHL level and keep his momentum going. Having three goalies up, we, you know, we've seen it happen a couple of times over the last few years, and as you said, it's rarely been successful. Let's make something happen here, uh, Rangers front office. Either make the move and ship Georgiev out, especially after this great performance, uh, or let's just sure can get some starts until things are more settled at the NHL level. Well, sure, but I mean, you, you're watching Georgiev perform, and he's been amazing. Why wouldn't you want to keep Georgiev and Shostyorkin if you're the Rangers? Lundqvist reaching the end of his tenure. Of course, you have kind of that Carey Price level of... Uh, I don't actually want to say it like that. I'm just in Canada, so it feels that way. Sorry, cut all of this. You Obviously, you have the New York Rangers icon in nets every couple of games, and as a Rangers fan, I'm definitely not advocating that they get rid of Lundqvist, but you could see either Georgiev or Lundqvist being the one on the way out. Why are they 
then continuing to roll out Shostyurkin when you could just be sending, keeping him in Hartford or, you know, you could... I, I just don't know. I don't truly know where we're headed because all options seem like they're on the table. A lot of people have talked about a Georgiev trade. That's fine. But if it's going to happen, why don't you go out and get it done? I would assume it's because they're not really getting the package that is available to them. So for now, I guess you're holding on to Georgiev I don't think that it's worth holding on to Shostyurkin or Lundqvist right now. Is this is this fantasy advice or am I just shaking my head, shrugging my shoulders and saying, well, like, I, I just don't know. The Rangers, for their part, have actually been pretty good lately, shockingly. Uh, the last 10 games, they are a 51.3% expected goals for squad. If you match that with good goaltending, you, you're pretty much talking about a playoff caliber team. So I, I just... I wish I knew what to tell people, you know. As a Rangers fan, I have a lot of people asking me about Shostyurkin, asking me about Georgiev, asking me about Lundqvist. I don't know what the team is going to do, and it's frustrating. You know, there's not a lot of incentive for other teams to throw a line to the Rangers. You know, they've put themselves in this position of having a three-headed monster, uh, and when your opponent is is struggling to stay afloat, throw them an anchor, not a life raft, right? I guess Sorry, um, I guess, but in general, you're talking about a team that has very low ambitions for this year. Like, maybe you make the playoffs and don't make any noise. So I think most of the, like, in most ways, the Rangers have something they could offer a team. Like, Alexander Georgiev would give the Toronto Maple Leafs, for example, the opportunity to rest Frederick Anderson down the stretch so he can perform in the playoffs this year. I, You know, that's just one example, but I, I think that what they have to offer is more than what other teams would lose by helping them out in this situation. And if you're not going to do anything, in my mind, if you're going to sit Shostyurkin for three games, why don't you just send him back down to the minors to play games in Hartford so he can keep the engine warm rather than leaving him cold in the press box? I'm with you on this free Shostyurkin team, and I just want to see him playing in more games. I think that would be way more interesting. You're right. From a management standpoint, make a deal. Or send him down. Those seem to be the only two options. And yet, here we are, shuffling through three goalies for the time being. Lewis, let's get into it tonight. Of course, on a Thursday, we are going to be doing the Patron 5, our weekly deep dives into five players as voted on by the Keeping Carlson patron-only Facebook group. You can become a patron at keepingcarlson.com slash patron in the Facebook group. Every single week, we have our patrons vote on five players they want to hear a little bit more about than just the surface-level conversation. And so we are going to go deep on these five specific players slash situations. And we're going to start out in Sunrise, where Vincent Trocek As Elon said in the poll that you posted the other day, Trocek on a four-game point streak, is he legit again? So as Elon is alluding to, Trocek started the year underwhelming on a 51-point pace through the first 34 games of the season, pacing for only 177 shots through that period too, which is his lowest pace in any of his past five seasons. Suddenly though, Trocek is on fire with six points in the past four games, Unfortunately for Trocek owners, the recent point streak isn't really coinciding with any type of uptick in time on ice, on the power play, or at even strength. So, in fact, he's only really topped 17 minutes of ice time during this point streak once, way down from 27-18, the year where he put up 75 points, while playing over 21 minutes per night. The one positive in this recent stretch of games is that over the past 10, Trocek has been shooting quite a bit more, and he's actually upped his shot pace to 210 shots over a full season. If he can continue that pace, I think that he can get those goal totals up. He has six goals to start the year. I think that could look quite a bit closer to 20 to 25, assuming he can shoot 210 pucks over this season. Still, though, absent improved line mates or power play deployment, I struggle to see him getting back up to that 70-point pace from a few years back. You know, he's still playing with Nola Chari and Brett Connolly. He's still off the top power play unit. So to me, he's back in the 60-point pace club for me. 
But that's as high as I'm really willing to go. It's up from the 50 points I projected him for when we chatted about him in a patron five a few months back. But, you know, I'm I'm not going crazy for Trocek. I'm not selling the farm to add him to the team. But, yeah, I, I think that he remains a decent depth guy. And if you get credit for peripherals, all the better. Yeah, I think a 60-point Trocek is pretty exciting because of the peripherals that he provides. That makes him a good kind of middle-of-your-team type player. Uh, you know, as good as a 70 point guy who's maybe not getting those peripherals, depending on your, your league setup. I think that p- people should be quite excited, I think, to, to see him getting back on track. It does certainly, as you say, make it look like those 75 points were the outlier for his career, barring, you know, getting back some of that super prime deployment that he was enjoying. But like we said, this is a productive guy, and it's nice to see him kind of get back to his more typical scoring ways and not being kind of stuck way down in, you know, sort of the nadir of a lot of his offensive statistics. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point that you made about him being kind of better than a 70-point guy with no peripherals. Um, That's sort of where I'm at as well. I I like Trocek in a bangers league especially. So, Lewis, why don't you get into the next player on our patron five list? All right, so we've got a player on quite the hot run right now, uh, nominated by Greg Sawchuk, Dominic Kubalik. Is he legit? This pace he's on isn't likely sustainable, but could he be a long-term hold? And this was a guy who got a lot of votes on the patron five. Uh, Kubalik, if you don't know, was a 2013 seventh round pick of the Kings, who was traded to Chicago for a fifth round pick. Dabber Prospects rates him as a 6.5 prospect, meaning they see him as a 65 point NHL forward at some point. Even with this breakout he's been on, he's pacing for about 40 points on the season, but really we're looking at a tale of two seasons so far with the first, uh, you know, 30 or so games being compared to the last 15 or so uh, when he's really become uh, quite offensively adept here. Uh, He's got 12 points over the last 10 games and has seen some really nice deployment during past that. uh, Excuse me. Kubelik has 12 points over the last 10 games and has seen some really nice deployment during that time. Over these past 10 games, he's been on pace for 110 points if he maintains it over an 82-game season. He's spent 86% of his minutes with Jonathan Taves and 24% of his minutes on a line with both Taves and Kane, uh, which as far as even strength deployment goes, it doesn't get any better than that in Chicago. His power play time has been pretty limited. He's only broken two minutes of power play play time on ice in three of those games and taken 30% of the total power play time on ice during that time period. Uh, He's only recorded a single power play assist, but the damage he's doing at even strength is really impressive. Uh, His current shooting percent isn't sustainable, 27%, uh, eight goals on 29 shots over the last 10 games, and he was extremely close to getting another one uh, during the Wednesday night match. Uh, But his overall numbers aren't too out of whack. He's scoring right around his individual expected goals number. Uh, And while shooting 16% in the season may be a little high for him, we really don't know what his, you know, where he might settle on the NHL level. Uh, Again, that's being goosed by this recent 27% success that's been over half his goals. So more than half of his goals coming in the last 10 of his 46 games. But obviously, easier to score when you get that prime deployment. You know, he could be that level of finisher while he's receiving passes from Taves, or at least in that neighborhood. His IPP is around 70%. His on-ice shooting percent is around 10%. These are reasonable numbers. And he's not even been super sheltered. He's starting just 47% of his non-neutral zone face-offs in the offensive zone. Uh, So while I, and probably very few others, save Mama Kubalik, uh, don't think he can keep up a 100-point pace. Uh, If his shooting percentage regresses back down to the season average of 16 and he keeps up his three shots a game pace, he'd score 17 more goals and end the season with 32, which is pretty darn good for a guy that you are likely picking up off the waiver wire. Uh, As long as he stays on the line with Taves, I think Kubalik is a hold. Uh, and I'd be willing to drop or trade guys like Jamie Benn or Ricard Raquel to get him. And I recognize that in the time that I, between prepping this and presenting it here on air, both of those players have scored. Uh, but that should make them all the more appealing to potentially offer them in a trade here. So you would trade Ricard Raquel or Jamie Benn, not just drop them, you would trade them to someone for Dominique Kubalik? 
Yeah, I think so. I don't think I would. In a one year? No, I mean, so in a in a, in a one year, I think that the drop makes sense because then you're hoping that the overall slump keeps them down. And if they start to turn it around, you could maybe grab the guy that you dropped. But if you're in a league where you're trading them, then you're trading them to people who are going to be holding on. I, I think that you could wind up with a waiver wire player if, you know, if the worst case scenario happens. Jamie Ben to me, as I've mentioned him before, I think he's still a 60, 65 point guy. I think that I would hold on to him. Uh, Ricard Raquel in that same sort of, I, yeah, I think I've downgraded Raquel enough that I could see making that deal. I just, I, I don't know why. I know Elon on the recent, was it the patron cast or the podcast where he said he's done with Ben forever? Uh, to me, I, I get it if you're talking about, you know, point per game, Art Ross trophy winning Jamie Ben, but if you've downgraded your expectations and you're looking for a 60 point player with peripheral upside, then I think he's too good to let go. Okay. I mean, I see it there. I, I've been trying to be more willing to let go of kind of, uh, you know, the, the value of some of these players that have been underachieving their expectations. But yes, I absolutely see where you're coming from. Certainly we know that the potential is there. And there is maybe some worry that if, say, a Brandon Saad comes back and starts sucking up some of those minutes alongside Taves, that probably makes Kubalik a waiver wire player, yeah? Yeah, I and like I said, if you were talking about a drop, I think that that's a lot more palatable to me. I just, it's tough for me to say that in a league where... Kubalik or or Ben are are trades rather than drops that that might be where I, I sort of hold my breath a little bit and hold Ben or um, as as I said I obviously value him a little bit more than Ricard Raquel but yeah no uh, Kubalik is someone who I am very interested in and I do think he's a must own right now like he should not be on a waiver wire in a deep league at all. Well, this is a good time to remind folks that if they want to get in touch with us and call our takes too crazy or criticize or compliment in any other way, uh, we can be followed on Twitter at AVG Time on Ice. Uh, and you are, we love to interact with, with our followers. So, uh, please give us a shout, even if it is to call me a lunatic here. Well, I actually think that I will be the unpopular one for saying that good things about Jamie Ben because I, I think that the fantasy hockey world is is very in love with Dominic Kubalik right now. Let's move on to the third player on our list here, and he is someone I've talked about before on this list, but in a much better context. Anthony Duclair, as patron Bob Law says, zero points, four shots on goal in his last four games is Duclair's snoozer territory. In a little update to these numbers. Anthony Duclair posted six shots and two hits tonight in a game against Vegas. No points, though, as that game has just ended. This is a tough one for me, as Duke is one of my flag players. And I do think it's difficult to think that he wasn't still recovering when the Sens brought him back from a lower body injury last week. I watched one of those games that went to overtime, and he ended up... He, he had played like 12 or 13 minutes, the lowest of any sense player to that point. And then they got a power play in overtime and they just parked him because he didn't need to do any skating. So he just kind of hung out around the blue line and they used him to, uh, to sort of pinch in towards the top circle so he could fire off some one timers, but he still looked awkward. He was off balance. It, it, he didn't look right. I'm guessing that, you know, most of the patrons who were very concerned about Duclair are less so after seeing the six shot performance tonight as I am myself but just in general I think that four or five games of no points for Duclair especially coming back off an injury that's just where you're a little bit too reactionary for me like in a in a shallow league I would understand moving off him especially because the conversation has turned so deeply against him so quickly but we're talking about someone who's on pace for over 35 goals this season uh, the assist totals aren't quite there to be a 60-point pace guy, but I he's on pace for 230 shots, 35-plus goals. If you're in a league where, you know, Kyle Connor, for example, in 2018-19 was valuable, that's exactly the season that Anthony Duclair is on pace for right now. So, uh, like I said, still a few games too early for me to to pound the panic button on the Duke. Yeah, I'm with you here. I think we're looking at a guy who is not playing at 100%. If you have the ability to kind of absorb 
a relatively weak player on your lineup for a little while. We do have the all-star break coming up. They're going to get a few games off, uh, and hopefully he'll come back a little more right. I love that Kyle Connor comparison. Obviously, we see what Connor is doing this year where he's a top 20 uh, player in the cupful. So if you can, if you can handle Duclair sort of underperforming here for a while while he gets right, I, I'm with you. I think this is someone that you hold on to. I don't want to panic on him yet because uh, that upside is is really good, and you'll be kicking yourself if he gets back into his midseason form. You know, in a couple weeks when he's feeling when he's feeling better. It's like I'm always saying, Lewis. If you can't handle Anthony Duclair at his pointless in four games, you don't deserve him at his forty goal pace. <laughs> I love it. All right, Lewis. Why don't you tell people about our fourth player on the list? Well. Uh, as we head towards our highest vote getters, we're noticing the pattern that people love to vote for goalies, and we have a doozy for us here. Uh, it is the Samsonov versus Holtby, and the question is, what is the split for the remainder of the season? Uh, I do have some skin in this game as a Samsonov owner across a number of different leagues. Um, but I will try and be as dispassionate and analytical as I can here. Samsonov has now play, had eight of his last ten games as quality starts. He had a nice game today where, you know, beating New Jersey is, is worth as much as, you know, you can, you can say it is. Um, but they have had some limited offensive success. You know, he gave up the uh, standard Blake Coleman shorthanded goal, which seems to come in just about every Devils game, but uh, played really nicely. So eight of the last 10 games are quality starts. He had a little blip of a game where he went in in relief and gave up one goal on four shots, but you, it's hard to hold that against him. Holtby, by comparison, you have to go back to December 21st to find a Holtby start above 900. You know, and it just has been really grim for him. And unlike some of these other situations, you know, look at Bobrovsky in Florida, where it seems like he's getting outplayed by this Chris Dreger guy. There's no real incentive for the coaches or the administrators in Washington to play a bunch of Holtby starts when it seems like you know, he is unlikely to be around for the future. A lot of the Caps folks in the know think that the Backstrom deal that was signed this week indicates that Holtby is done in Washington, that they're not going to be able to re-sign him. Dom Lucician is out there writing articles about not falling into the trap of huge long-term goalie contracts. Uh, Bobrovsky, Price, Vasilevsky, he brings up as examples of where that can be dangerous, and he talks about Holtby potentially being someone's next mistake. So, and we've seen this before, right? Grubauer stole starts from Holtby previously during a similarly bad stretch, and that was with Grubauer as a pending UFA and Holtby still under contract. So there's even less of a reason to stick to the status quo when the front office is likely thinking about seeing what Samsonov offers down the line here, and it seems as if they've seen enough to say, you know, we can sign Backstrom to this deal that maybe does not leave us with enough cap room to bring Holtby back. So that being said, you know, there's some risk in grabbing Samsonov because you've got uh, an established guy there. All it would take would be a few bad games or a few good ones from Holtby to sort of reverse the current trend. But I am willing to guess that Samsonov would get 60 to 70% of the starts moving forward. He's got two losses and one overtime loss, and I believe 13 wins now uh, after this most recent game. So he has been just outstanding. He's been winning almost everything he can. Seems like the Samsonov era may be dawning here for good. Yeah, Samsonov is definitely interesting. And this is one of those things, it's all about timing, right? And I think if he's still available in your league, and there's you have any level of need at goaltending, this might be the time to grab him. Lewis, I do think you may have lost a few people talking about how Vasilevsky is in the ballpark of a Bobrovsky or Price type overpay. But, you know, in general, I do agree, of course, that overpaying goaltenders heading into their 30s has been a bad time for all the teams involved, save for my wonderful New York Rangers. Well, I am merely uh, passing along the arguments that Dom was making in his article. So uh, you'll have to take that one up with The Athletic. 
That's fair enough. And I mean, Vasilevsky has been underperforming from an advanced stats metric. We're, of course, a fantasy hockey podcast, so we're not worried about the underlyings. We just care about results, baby. Uh, so yeah, go ahead and get Samsonov if you can. Holtby, is Holtby a drop if Samsonov, this is, so, this is what we've been receiving on Twitter the last couple days. People have been asking us, are you dropping Holtby to add Samsonov? Is it too hot to do it? The first thing I would say is if you've got a streamer, drop your streamer and handcuff yourself in Washington for a while. They're an outstanding team. It's not like you're giving up wins and hoping to get rates. I So yes, we did get this question a couple times on Twitter. Yeah, I think I'm ready to drop Holpi. I want a goalie who is winning games. I want a goalie who is capable of providing quality starts. Like I said, you're going back nearly a month to find a start, not, you know, a start above 900, not even looking for that 9, 10 or above. It just has been so bad for Holtby and there's so much excitement around Sam Sonov and looking to the future. Why would you break up this rhythm? Uh, if, you know, are people going to be anxiously diving into the waiver wire to get Holtby back right now when he is, you know, missing multiple games in a row and hasn't had much success? I'm proud of you for taking the plunge. I'm not sure that I'm, that I'm there, that I can, that I can advocate for doing same, but, uh, good for you. I would, I would be, I would be much more on the drop anyone else that you can drop your streamer. Type And then if you absolutely have to, there's no one else there and you need to take a swing for the rest of the season, then go for it. But I'm a bit of a coward in this way. I don't like losing because of guys that I dropped, especially if they have a track record of being uh, game changers. So that's why I would I would be a little hesitant to drop Holtby. But I do think that there are there's a situation where that is absolutely the right thing to do. Yeah, you know, like I said, I'm with you in that. I think that it makes a lot of sense for you to drop a streamer before you are dropping Holtby. I, I recommended it off the top, but maybe I am more ready than you uh, to see him to see him go. Uh, you know, I've been trying to be more aggressive, I think, in turning over some of my goalies just because I've been burned the last couple of years by holding on to them too long. So there's a lot of interesting options out there. And if Samsonov does start to lose some of his starts, but Holtby keeps kind of underperforming, you may be just as well off grabbing one of the other interesting, emerging, you know, backups, turn starters, or or the like. Well, Lewis, let's get into one more of those interesting goalie options. And let's chat about Elvis Merzlikens, the fifth and final member of our patron five and the highest vote getting option on the Keeping Carlson patron only Facebook page. Alex Wyatt described why he wanted us to chat about Merzlikens. Barely used this season and stunk. Now with Corpusalo down, he's answered the bell. What happens when Corpusalo comes back to Columbus? Alex is right. Merzlikens has been incredible the last few weeks. He started eight straight. He had six wins and seven quality starts. And also had back-to-back shutouts. His shutout streak was finally broken in Carolina tonight, where the Blue Jackets won... 3-2, so he still posted a pretty solid night for you. I think as long as Corpusalo is out, Merzlikens is a top option and has been good enough to steal a few matchups on his own for you the last couple weeks. I definitely would be grabbing him off the waiver wire if he was available in my league right now. However, I do think that the run that Corpy was on before his injury is enough to say that Merzlikens is likely not the sole starter when he comes back. So, while he could be playing his way into a 1B role at this point, I'd want to hold on to him speculatively when Corpusalo comes back. See how this whole thing shakes out. For now, enjoy how good he's been. Hopefully, if you're a Merzlikens owner, he gets several more games here before we see the return of Corpusalo. And hopefully, if you're a Corpusalo owner, Corpusalo can be back slightly after the All-Star break. I think we could see a 1A, 1B situation here. And if that's the case, I think that they're both usable the same way that I think, say, Varlamov and Grice were usable when that was a split. Enjoy how good Merzlikens has been. There are very few goalies performing at his level right now. But I would not count on him being a Tier 1 goalie for the rest of the season, just because I think his opportunity will dwindle. Yeah, I think performance, obviously, it's been unimpeachable, but 
the number of starts that he's likely to get when Corpusala comes back and if those two are sort of battling for it. I think it'll overall be very good for Columbus, but from a fantasy perspective, not going to be so effective for you individually uh, with these goalies unless you can somehow wrangle yourself the handcuff. I'm with you there. So, Ben, it looks like we have wrapped up our patron five and are just about out of time for the night. Any final thoughts here? Yeah, I want to say I and I tweeted it stealthily while you were while you were chatting about Dominic Kubalik. Big save Dave back and I am here for it. Yeah, surprising another one of those surprising deployments we thought Monday for sure was going to be a Talbot day, not a Riddick day, but he came back and had a nice game. Seems like as as you texted me earlier today, uh rumors of big save Dave's death were greatly exaggerated. Yeah, kind of a bummer for Talbot, who basically came in last week, put up three incredible games, was named the NHL's third star of the week, and then they gave Dave the opportunity to steal that stuff, that uh, spot back. I think that goes to show what's going on in Calgary. They do want Dave Riddick to be their number one guy moving forward. And I apologize if I've been saying Riddick. I should be saying Riddick. Corrected by uh, South Park character Randy Marsh, who's a Facebook profile on our Keeping Carlson Facebook group. Uh, he, he pointed out it is Riddick, not Riddick. I can old habits die hard. But yeah, I I think that this goes to show the Flames really want Riddick to work it out and they really want him to be the number one moving forward. So I'm happy to see him answer the call these last couple games. Yeah, I think that is a valuable takeaway for fantasy owners to kind of get this understanding of where that goalie battle really lies. And that Talbot is pretty firmly in the goalie two position is not a 1B trending towards 1A, uh, despite his great performance. Well, Lewis... That's it for tonight. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. On Saturday, I will be back with a guest hosting the patron-only Facebook stream every single Saturday. One hour before Puck Drop, we hang out, answer patron questions. Uh, Everybody comes into the chat. We hang out, have some coffee. It's always a little bit earlier for me being on Mountain Time. But uh, thank you so much, dude. And I will see you next week. All right. Much appreciation to Yahoo Fantasy, Natural Stat Trick, The Athletic, and Dom Musician uh, for helping us research our episode. Thank you for the patrons for making this an easy episode to plan by telling us what players they want to hear about and what they want to hear about them. Really excellent. We are signing off, and until we see you next week, make sure you play smart and keep your shifts short.